Hi, and welcome back to U.S. History with me, Mr. Snyder. And today we are going to begin the discussion of the 45, 46-year period after World War II of the Cold War, marking the beginning of the uh, disagreement between the Soviet Union and the United States. So in the 1930s, the United States was isolationist, and the appeasement of Great Britain and France did nothing to stop the rise of dictatorships and the outbreak of World War II. So after World War II, we now view these policies as mistakes, and we, cannot, we can no longer afford to sit on the sidelines. We need to get involved. And so we're seeking new ways to keep the U.S. safe, as well as to protect our interests around the world. So... When you really go back and look at it, the, the Americans and Soviets were kind of a, a weird bedfellows. Like we just got involved in World War II and we were only allies because we wanted to both destroy Nazi Germany. Now that that's done, what's next? There's, there's really nothing left for us to do. So differences between the United States and Soviet Union, if you look at it, we're capitalists, they're communists. We're a democracy. They are oppressive. We have free elections. We have religious freedom. They have no religious or economic freedom. We have economic freedom, and we have private property, and they have public property. Now, after World War II, deciding on what to do with Germany and the rest of the world at Potsdam, we want, and Great Britain wants, a stronger united Germany. And the division into the zones of occupation would only be temporary, whereas Stalin wants Germany to remain divided and weak, and he wants to exercise his own control over Eastern Europe. So he previously agreed at Yalta to hold free elections in Eastern Europe, and at Potsdam he would not confirm his decision that he made at Yalta. He wouldn't say it, and that's because he really wanted to control Eastern Europe. And uh, Truman left Potsdam saying, this isn't going to work, you know, he was distrustful of Stalin, and he doesn't think that they're going to be able to work together. And so this is the unraveling of the wartime alliance. And sure enough, Eastern Europe remains under his control. Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and East Germany all become satellite states of the Soviet Union, which means countries that they are controlled by the Soviet Union. If you think of a satellite away from the Earth, it's away from the Earth, but we still control it. Well, just like these countries are away from the Soviet Union, they are still under the Soviet Union's control. Winston Churchill, no longer prime minister, becomes prime minister later, but then retires and uh, calls the separation of East and West Europe an Iron Curtain. And behind that Iron Curtain, to the east of it, where the Soviets are, uh, Stalin is imposing communist governments, police states, and uh, crushing political and religious dissent. And so this unraveling of the wartime alliance and distrust of one another is the beginning of the Cold War. War, which is the 46-year disagreement between the Soviet Union and the United States. And it only ends when the Soviet Union dissolves and uh, no longer exists beginning in 1991. And there's highs and lows in the Cold War. There's times where it's very tense. There's times where it's cooled off. And there's periods of what, the, what they call detente. Uh, but they, it's called the Cold War because we never face each other directly in military conflict. It's never the Soviet Union versus the United States. It's always indirectly. We face each other indirectly in Korea. We face each other indirectly in Vietnam. It, there's lots of other instances where we're backing one side and they're backing the other. So they want communism to spread to Western Europe, and other countries in Western Europe are fighting against the spread of communism, and they're losing. So the United States is really the only country after World War II that is strong enough to give resources to help the spread of uh, help prevent the spread of communism. So Truman requests money for two of those countries from Congress and gives a detailed struggle or um, narrative of how the Greece and Turkish people are struggling against communism. So Congress approves $400 million in aid to Greece and Turkey. And Truman also pledges to help any other country that is struggling against communist movements. This becomes known as the Truman Doctrine. Okay, the Truman Doctrine is the United States will help 
any uh, country struggling against communist movements. So our foreign policy, how we deal with other countries, begins to develop under Truman, and its main architect is George F. Kennan. George F. Kennan is an American diplomat, and he's the leading source on the Soviet Union. Uh, he worked in the Soviet Union as an American for, the, for a long time. And he writes an article for the magazine Foreign Affairs called The Sources of Soviet Conduct, and it, he authored it under the letter X. I'm assuming he wanted to remain anonymous, but it soon learned that it's George Kennan. And this uh, article becomes the blueprint for the U.S. foreign policy of containment. And containment is going to be our guiding light. It's going to be how we run things. It, and the goal of containment is to keep communism inside its existing borders. So we're going to contain it, put it in a container, contain. That's the root word of this. Kennan believes that the Soviets aren't going to expand unless it can do so without any serious risks, and the United States isn't going to allow that to happen. However, there's no easy, quick solution to the Soviet problem. It's going to be a long struggle, according to Kennan, and it is. One of the first parts of containment is called the Marshall Plan. Uh, Western Europe after World War II is over and all the fighting's been done there, it's in dire need of help. There's shortages of food, fuel, and medical supplies. So in 1948, uh, the Secretary of State, former General George C. Marshall, unveils his Marshall Plan. And this is to provide $13 billion in aid for Europe in the next four years. And we also offer it to the Eastern European nations, but Stalin prevents them from accepting it. So the goal of this is like threefold. We intend to jumpstart economic growth uh, so that we have stronger countries to trade with in Western Europe. Uh, we will also want to build relationships with these countries. And those nations that accept aid from the United States are going to work against the spread of communism. And so now we get to the division of Germany. Here you can see the United States zone, the French zone, the British zone, and the uh, Soviet zone. Those three zones uh, that we have, British, French, and the United States, form together to become the Federal Republic of Germany. We're simply going to refer to it as West Germany. Uh, East Germany, or the Soviet zone, becomes its own um, its own zone, and it's known as the German Democratic Republic, but it's not a democratic republic. Berlin is inside West, or I'm sorry, Berlin is inside East Germany, but that is divided up in the same way, French, British, U.S., and Soviet. So we still own West Berlin, and it's inside, deep inside of East Germany. So this is, this becomes a problem for us, uh, like I said, U.S., France, and Great Britain join their zones together and form West Germany. In 1948, Stalin stops all of the traffic into West Berlin. Air, um, sorry, water traffic, uh, road traffic, train traffic, all of it stops. So now no supplies are getting into West Berlin, and supplies are running short. But Stalin can't stop the air traffic into West Berlin. We can still fly over these uh, quarantines that he's put in place and these blockades that he's put in place. We can fly over those. If he shoots down one of our U.S. planes, he could start another war, and he won't risk losing communism in the Soviet Union in a war with the United States, one that he knows at this point he'll lose because we have an atomic weapon and he does not. So the U.S. and Britain fly supplies into West Berlin for over a year, well over a year, 462 days. Uh, there's planes landing every 30 seconds at the height of it, um, 134 million miles flown, 278,000 flights, 2.3 million tons, million tons of uh, food, coal, and medical supplies, we're not going to abandon the people in West Berlin to communism. So this is known, what Stalin did is the Berlin blockade, and what we did is the Berlin airlift. And it's a huge success, and after this we 
form alliances with countries that want to help in efforts such as this. So Western uh, European countries and the United States and Canada form the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. Uh, and it's a collective security organization. And it means an armed attack on one member means an armed attack on all of them. So if you hit one of us, you hit all of us. And the first time this was actually used was well after the Cold War was over at, in September 11th attacks in 2001. And then the Soviet Union and their satellite states formed the Warsaw Pact, which all communist states in Eastern Europe, except Yugoslavia, are members. And the Soviet Union unofficially controls all of the member nations' affairs in the Warsaw Pact, whereas that's not the truth in NATO. But these two alliances are going to dominate the Cold War. And then here's some pictures of the Berlin Airlift. And here are the Cold War alliances. Uh, the NATO and the Warsaw Pact. So uh, that is your learning targets for today. Please fill them out, bring back any questions you have, and I will see you later. Have